Now, The Sky at Night with Patrick Moore. Good evening. We've had some very rough weather recently, and this evening we're going to talk about rough weather far away across the universe. Storms, whirlpools, cyclones, even colliding galaxies. But first of all, two news notes very much near to home. This is a meteorite found recently in the Sahara Desert, and said to be one of more than a dozen to have come from the planet Mars, blasted away a long time ago. So is that a piece of Mars? I admit I have grave reservations, but um, I may well be wrong. On January the 26th, I began having phone calls about a very bright object seen close to the moon. And I had letters too. Here's one from Zoe Farnsworth. She says, well, age date. Here's one from Mrs. Hintelson. And uh, this, in fact, was the planet Jupiter, very nearly occulted or hidden by the moon. It was a grazing occultation of Jupiter by the moon. And Ray Emery of the Leeds Astronomical Society has sent this very fine video. And there's Jupiter with the cloud belts. And look how small it appears compared with the moon. A lovely video, so thank you very much, Ray Emery. And now on to our main theme. I'm sure you know the story that if you let water out of a bath, it goes down the plug hole in a whirlpool, one way in the northern hemisphere and the other way in the southern hemisphere. Well, be that as it may, we do get whirlpools in space also on a much larger scale. And to talk about them, I'm delighted to welcome back Professor Chris Kitchen. Welcome back, Chris. Hello, Patrick. First of all, this story that the water goes down in opposite ways in the two hemispheres, there's something in it. Yes, and it's all because the Earth is a sphere rotating upon its own axis. Um, any movement over the surface of the Earth, unless it's directly along an east-west line, must take you either closer to the equator or further away from it. Uh, since the Earth is rotating, the further away you are from the equator, the slower your speed due to the rotation. However, if you do move away from the equator, then conservation of angular momentum means that you retain the speed you had at your original position when you moved to the new position. And therefore, you should be moving over the surface from west to east. Of course, if you actually try this, say by jumping in a car and driving a few miles north, friction will stop you sliding sideways. Uh, but nonetheless, you will feel a force, a very tiny one, uh, but nonetheless it's there uh, pushing you towards the east. This, of course, is the famous Coriolis effect. It applies a material too. Low down, the push is to the east. Higher up, the push is to the west, because you're then further away from the center of the earth. And this represents the Eiffel Tower. I hasten to add, not to scale. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And since the, the vertical direction is only at 90 degrees to the rotational axis, if you're actually on the equator, the whirlpool should rotate anti-clockwise here in the north, and south of the equator, it should rotate clockwise. And that's the effect that we're talking about in terms of water going down the plug hole. But of course, if you actually take a bath, then getting in and out and pulling out the plug hole generates vortices that are far stronger than those produced by the Coriolis forces. And so if you try the experiment, you'll find that the whirlpool goes in each direction more or less randomly. But we can see the effect if we look on a much larger scale by observing hurricanes and cyclones. Uh, these are tropical storms that arise as air rises through the atmosphere and the Coriolis forces do then push them into spirals. And this time, uh, they are different between the two hemispheres. Uh, here we can see Hurricane Michel, uh, close to Cuba in the northern hemisphere, clearly rotating anti-clockwise. And then we have Cyclone Huda near Madagascar in the south of the equator, and that is obviously rotating clockwise. But there are plenty of spiral structures in our galaxy, and by, all means, by no means all of these are due to the Coriolis effect. Uh, no, and we can see some here on Jupiter. Uh, these are the results of turbulence as material flows past the Great Red Spot. The not Voyager to pictures, the, of course. Their Voyager pictures. Um, the same effect, however, does occur on the Earth. Uh, turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere, either due to wind moving past an obstacle or something passing through the air, uh, produces turbulent eddies, and we can see an example here behind an aircraft in this experiment produced by NASA a few years ago. Let's look now at one or two spiral structures in space, beginning with the Helix Nebula, and Aquarius the water bearer, 
and this is a picture of the helix. You can see there the, the spiral structure quite clearly. It's due to the old star in the middle having thrown away its outer envelope. It's not quite so clear, though, in this case, why the helix is there. Uh, it may be due to the star in the centre from which the material came being a binary star and having a wobbling orbit and the material coming out in the form of jets uh, so that it's then rather like whirling hosepipe around your head. Uh, spirals, though, aren't all that common amongst the planetary nebulae, but there are other, other examples. And this is the Cat's Eye Nebula in Draco. Uh, here we can see the nebula on a Lick photograph uh, showing the uh, spirals quite clearly, and here in incredible detail, a Hubble Space Telescope photograph. The structures in this case probably arise from the same sort of um, process, a, a wobbling binary star at the centre. In other cases, though, the spiral form is very much less evident. Uh, yes, uh, many amateur astronomers will have spent hours looking at uh, Orion's nebula, and nearby to that nebula is the wonderful dark horsehead nebula. But that's a much more difficult object to see through a telescope. It is indeed. On a photograph, though, it shows up marvellously, silhouetted against the red light coming from the hot hydrogen gas that is behind it. This may, it's not certain, be a vortex just starting to occur between the hot gas in the top half of the image and the cool, dusty gas in the bottom half. Uh, a sort of corkscrewing tornado on a galactic scale. Well, that's in our galaxy, but when we think about spirals, we think straight away, I think, of those lovely spiral galaxies. Yes, and uh, my favourites amongst many are M83, Messier 83 in Hydra. That's lovely. At the tail of the serpent and quite close to Libra. It's actually the most southerly galaxy in Messier's list, and one of the few galaxies that was seen to be spiral before photography came along. Uh, this is how it appeared to William Lassell around about 1860 through a 1.2 metre telescope sighted in Malta. Even before that, the spirals were discovered by the third Earl of Ross using his homemade 72 inch reflector, a Burkhaster and Allen. And in 1845, he made this drawing of M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy and the Hunting Dogs, and that ties in very well with the modern photograph. He saw others too. Here is Messier 99, another spiral. Here is Messier 33, the triangulum spiral, much looser one. And here, the lovely Messier 100. And for a long time, only the Burr telescope was able to show those spirals. Now, of course, they're very common. Yes, and most of them are very beautiful. M83, though, has got something of particular interest about it. It is a spiral that is intermediate in shape between the normal gal spiral galaxies and what are called the barred spirals. And it's this intermediate type of galaxy that our own, the Milky Way galaxy, is thought to be like. We can't, of course, see our own galaxy in the optical region, but we can plot out its shape using radio telescopes, and this is what it looks like at radio wavelengths. So we therefore know that if we were able to move outside our galaxy and look back towards it, what we would see is something like M83, and comparing the two images, you can see the very close resemblance. I always find it rather hard to visualise our Milky Way galaxy as, uh, as a barred spiral. Well, it isn't truly a barred spiral. There are two main types of spirals. The normal galaxies, like M100 here, where the spiral arms come out directly from the nucleus. And then there are those like this one, NGC 1365, where the nucleus appears to have a spindle going through it and the spiral arms come out from the ends of that spindle, or bar, and hence this type are called the barred galaxies. Now, although it's not as clear as it is in this case, NGC 1365, if we look back at M83 for a moment, we can see that the nucleus is a little bit elongated. And likewise for the Milky Way, the nucleus is about twice as long as it is broad. And so these two galaxies are classed as intermediate between the normal spirals and the barred spirals. One interesting point, though, these spirals are in rotation. And we want to expect the material near the centre to move around more quickly than the material further out. Therefore, the arms should wind up, but they don't. Yes, and uh, there's a very nice uh, simulation that anybody can do uh, using cream into coffee. Oh, yeah. um, in fact, though, because it shows up rather better, I'm going to use a drop of milk. Um, if we get that rotating, like 
a spiral galaxy would. Yeah. Get it going. And then a tiny drop of cocoa powder. We should see the same effect. The reason why spiral arms don't wind up in the way that this material is winding up is they simply don't live long enough. Uh, spiral arms only are visible for a few tens of millions of years. Then they disappear and new ones form in their place. Uh, but it would take hundreds of millions of years for the rotation of the galaxy to wind them up the way the cocoa on top of the milk has wound up. We must ask then, why do the arms disappear? Why don't they persist? Well, the spiral appearance of galaxies is actually rather deceptive. The material in the disk is much more unifor uniformly distributed uh, than it appears. Uh, it's just that a lot of the material we can't see. Average stars, like the Sun, are simply too faint to be seen at distances of millions of light years. So when we look at spiral galaxies, what we are seeing are those regions containing numerous large, bright, uh, young stars. Large stars may have a mass 10, 100 times even greater than that of the Sun. But they are also very, very much brighter than the Sun, and so they use their material up very much more quickly. A star 30 times the mass of the Sun, sun for example, probably only lasts for about 10 million years. So the spiral arms are conspicuous because they contain the most luminous stars. Yes, and they will disappear when those bright stars die off in a few tens of millions of years. There will still, however, be millions of smaller stars in that region continuing to live out their much longer lives. By then, of course, there will be new star-forming regions uh, elsewhere in the galaxy, and those regions, the bright stars in those regions, will continue to give a spiral appearance to the galaxy. Now, uh, one vital question. Why do spiral arms form at all? Well, there's thought to be two processes at work which produce spirals of rather different appearance. The first type are called the flocculent spirals, and they appear like NGC 7793 here. The spiral pattern is actually quite chaotic, mm, yeah. and if you look carefully, is made up of lots of small segments rather than single arms. The second, rather less common type, are called the grand design spirals. They usually have just two arms, and they are clear and well-defined, like those in NGC 1300. Let's go back to your flocculent galaxies for a moment. What happens to them? It's really just the winding up process that we've talked about in the milk in the coffee cup, or cream in the coffee, um, except it's only occurring for a brief interval, comparatively brief, that is. The inner parts of the galaxy take a shorter period of time to go round than the outer parts. So if we imagine a star-forming region out in the disk of the galaxy, the part of that region closer to the centre will move ahead of the region, part of the region further out, and so over a few million years it will be drawn out into a short curved streamer. When there are many such star-forming regions, each gets stretched out in the same way, and so we get the individual curved segments that give the flocculent spirals their spiral appearance. But the situation isn't quite so clear-cut as one might think. It's um, been found rather unexpectedly that in a spiral galaxy, the outer part stars are moving as quickly as those closer to mm. the centre, and that wasn't expected at all. No. But of course, it's, it's the angular displacement of the matter, so it comes to the same thing, really, I suppose. In the end, yes. And of course, the grand design galaxies process there are a bit different. Well, it's rather less clear altogether how these galaxies form. One recent theory that has gained a lot of credence is that it is a pressure wave moving out from the centre of the galaxy. As that wave passes through the material of the disk, it initiates a bout of star formation. Just as with the flocculent galaxies, though, it's only the young, bright stars that we can see. And when those die, that part of the spiral arm disappears. But by then, the pressure wave has moved on and initiated a new bout of star formation further around the galaxy. Yes, but what causes those pressure waves? Well, then the theories do become even more vague. Exactly. Um, one possibility is a, an explosion or series of explosions occurring at the centre of the galaxy, perhaps as material falls into the central black hole. Uh, perhaps we can see such events as the Seyfert galaxies, uh, such as M77 here. These have very, very small, intense centres to their nuclei, which is where the explosions are occurring. 
Alternatively, the pressure wave might be produced through gravitational perturbations caused by the bar through the centre of the galaxy. Perhaps both processes are at work, though probably not at the same time in any single individual galaxy. Then again, there may be some process which we have yet to discover. However, there is one situation where we can be fairly certain of how the pressure wave starts off, and that's when galaxies collide. When galaxies collide, they, the stars don't often hit each other head on, but the gas and dust between the stars are colliding all the time. Yes, it's not the collisions or non-collisions between the stars that matter, it's the gravitational pulls of the galaxies, in other words, the tides on each other, that cause the spiral arms. We've already seen the effects of a glancing collision when we looked at the Whirlpool galaxy. Oh, yes. uh, the smaller galaxy, which looks more or less spherical, but is in fact a spiral, NGC 5195, uh, passed by the larger galaxy, NGC 5194, about 200 million years ago. The effects of that collision can still be seen in the bridge of material pulled out by the tides between the two galaxies. I think my favourite colliding galaxies are the antennae in Corvus. Here's a, here's a wide-angle fo photograph. You can just about see the streamers, but in infrared, it comes out beautifully. You can understand why they're called the antennae, can't you? Um, it is two colliding galaxies, and a lot of theoretical work has gone into this pair uh, to try and understand the details of the collision. We can see here a computer simulation produced by John Dubinsky of the University of Toronto. The two spiral galaxies collide uh, almost head-on, and at this stage of the process, they duplicate almost exactly how we see the antennae today. However, the simulation allows us to see how those galaxies are going to change over the next few hundred million years. Another similar system is the MICE, or NGC 4676, seen here in a simulation by Joshua Barnes. Perhaps most fascinating of all, our own galaxy, the Milky Way, and the Andromeda galaxy, M31, are on a collision course. That collision will occur about 3,000 million years from now. And perhaps what will happen is shown in this computer simulation, again due to John Dubinsky. The two galaxies come together uh, and then separate again, uh, producing briefly spirals, but finally come together to produce uh, a giant elliptical galaxy. During the process, however, millions of stars are flung off completely from the galaxies to wander, to wander intergalactic space alone, and that could, of course, include the Sun and all the planets. I think these spiral galaxies teach us a great deal, and certainly there are great cosmic whirlpools in space. Chris, thank you very much. Thank you, Pip. Some time ago, we did a programme about the Star of Bethlehem, and had David Hughes, Mark Kudrow and myself, all with different theories. Uh, Mark with his uh, Nova, David with his Triple Conjunction, and me with the Meteors. We had a poll, and I didn't come out very well. Well, that poll's closed now, but if you can tune into our website, Here's our web number, www.bbc.co.uk slash space, or of course CFAX page 620. And when I come back next month, I'm going to be talking about one of the most famous objects in the night sky, one you'll all know, Ursa Major, the Great Bear. So until then, good night.